This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. Machine learning has become so pervasive that you probably interact with it dozens of times a day without even knowing it. When Netflix curates movies and shows on your homepage based on the ones you've already watched, that is machine learning at play. And the type of artwork that appears on the thumbnails for those shows, that is also curated and selected based on its understanding of your preference for different artwork to try and get you to click and play and keep watching. If you watch a lot of comedies, Netflix is far more likely to show you a thumbnail with Robin Williams in it for Goodwill Hunting. Or if you binge rom-coms, you are more likely to get one showing Matt Damon and Mini Driver. When you open Uber, its machine learning platform uses variables like weather, time of day, traffic, and historic data to set a price for your trip. When Google Maps warns you about a traffic jam and directs you to an alternate, faster route, this is also machine learning working behind the scenes. When Facebook shows you targeted ads or Amazon recommends specific items to you, this is all machine learning working behind the scenes. And while machine learning is a marketing team's dream come true, can this type of artificial intelligence be used for more than just pushing ads and increasing sales. What if the same tactics used by companies to maximize their revenue could also be used to help benefit the human race? More and more, researchers are doing just this, implementing machine learning to help with disaster relief, climate change monitoring, and in healthcare. In particular, recent advances in biological and computer sciences are driving scientists to use machine learning methods for cancer research with a recent Microsoft project aiming to solve cancer using artificial intelligence and other large-scale computing initiatives working to diagnose and treat cancer more efficiently than ever before. But how can a computer fight one of the most complex and deadly challenges humans face? First, we need to understand what machine learning is and how it works. To put it simply, machine learning is the science of getting computers to solve problems without being programmed. On a broad level, there are two types of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. In unsupervised machine learning, you do not tell the network what to look for in the data you give it. This is often used for exploring data by helping to infer patterns you might not recognize otherwise. In supervised machine learning, you specify what particular feature or trait you want your model to learn about. You have an existing set of data called the training set, which contains both input variables and an output variable. You can then use an algorithm to learn the relationship between the input and output variables, so it can later predict an output based on the new input data. This is the kind of machine learning that researchers can use to sift through millions of pieces of information to help understand how cancers develop and what treatments will work best to fight them. One of the most interesting types of supervised machine learning is the artificial neural network. This type of machine learning was inspired by the biological neural networks present in our brains, and they are excellent tools for finding relationships between variables in your data set that are too complex for a human to recognize. And this type of machine learning is very powerful. It's one way scientists are predicting cancer before it even happens, by analyzing the interaction of genes, nutrients, and demographic indicators, and their relationship to cancer development, Teams of researchers are using neural networks to help predict the likelihood someone will develop breast cancer. While their methods are complicated, let's use a simplified version of their study to explain how neural networks work. Before you can use any neural network, you first need a dataset that contains lots of the information you are hoping to analyze. In this case, the training dataset contains information about the patient's genetics, demographics, and nutrition, such as intake of vitamins, along with information about which individuals developed breast cancer. This is the data that is needed to train the neural network, since with this data, we know which individuals did and did not have cancer develop. It is a dataset for which the correct output is already known. In this study, 75% of the data is used to train the network, and around 25% is reserved to later test how good the network is operating. A neural network is composed of an input layer, one or more hidden layers, and an output layer. During the training stage of the neural network machine learning, you first feed the network your input variables at the input layer, which in our example is the patient's age, body mass index, the number of pregnancies she has had, whether or not she is pre or post menopausal, and details of genetic analysis, along with intake of different nutrients in their diet, such as the amount of folate, vitamins B2, B6, and B12 that are consumed on a regular basis. In this example, the output variable would be whether or not the patient had breast cancer develop, represented as a zero for no and one for yes. 
This is a simplified version of the inputs in this study for explanation's sake, but even still, you can see that this is a ton of data and any relationship between these factors and cancer occurrence might not be obvious. So for the neural network to begin learning from this data, you first add your input data at the input layer. It then flows through the hidden layers, eventually arriving at the output layer. Each layer receives inputs from the layers to its left. As the inputs move between layers, they are multiplied by random weights which can be assigned to each of the connections they travel along. Individual weights represent the strength of connections between layers and are the most important factor in converting the input layer to the output layer. Bias and an activation function are also added to the input data as it moves through the network. In an example like ours, an activation function, like a sigmoid function, would squash any output results to lie between a 0 and 1. As the input data from each patient flows through the network for the first time, it will arrive at the output layer as some new, basically random value between 0 and 1, which is almost guaranteed to be incorrect. The next step is where the learning comes in. For a neural network to learn, there has to be an element of feedback involved. This is done through a process called back propagation. This involves comparing the output that was just produced with the output it was meant to produce, which we know since this is still the training data set, and then using the difference between them to modify the weights of the connections between the layers in the network, and then running the network again. The goal is to run the network over and over again, each time adjusting the weights, and each time getting closer to the right answer. But how does the network know which way to correct itself? It knows the outputs that it's producing are wrong, but how does it know how to adjust the weights in the direction of getting a correct answer? It does this through a process called gradient descent. It's a process that is used to move the network toward the lowest possible error in its output. Gradient descent is the backbone of neural networks and is the most used learning algorithm in machine learning. In order to carry out gradient descent, you first need a cost function. A cost function provides a measure of how far off the guest output is from the actual output, and it is simply a measure of how much error there is in the network. This is typically expressed as a difference between the predicted value and the actual value. For a given data point, you can plot the error against one connection's weight as it changes with each iteration. Here is a cost function plotted against just one weight. To get the best neural network possible, we are looking to minimize the cost function, meaning we are looking to choose the weight that aligns with the lowest point in the cost function. So if the goal for the network is to find the lowest point of this function, it can calculate the derivative of the cost function with respect to this one weight to know the direction it needs to move towards in order to find the local minima. Then through trial and error, making steps toward the minimum, the model will gradually converge towards the lowest value of the function. However, this shows the cost function plotted against just one weight. In a real model, we don't look at the error value for each separate connection and weight. We want to know about the error across all connections. Therefore, we need a cost function that measures the average amount that the model's predictions vary from the correct values. The mean squared error cost function is the most common cost function used to address this, and it looks like this. We don't need to go into details about what all this means, we just need to know that once this equation is derived and solved, it will provide the gradient that the model needs to know the direction that it should take in order to reduce errors across all weights in the network. Then, once it knows which direction it needs to move towards to get to the correct weight of each connection, it needs to know how much to move in that direction. This is determined by something called the learning rate. With a high learning rate, it can cover more ground each step, but it risks overshooting the lowest point. With a low learning rate, it can confidently move in the direction of the negative gradient, since it is recalculating it so frequently, which is more precise, but also more time consuming. The learning rate is usually determined by trial and error to find the rate that works best for the model. The network will process the input data in this way, adjusting the weights, arriving at new outputs, repeating this process again and again until the error is sufficiently small and the actual and intended output coincide. At this point, training is complete and you can now test the network with the 25% of the data you reserved for testing. Using our example, the neural network should at this point be able to take the input data for someone who developed breast cancer and predict correctly that they did based on their input data. It should also be able to see that based on the input data for those that did not have cancer, that they indeed did not develop cancer. 
At this point, you can present the network with an entirely new set of inputs, data from a new group of patients where you do not know whether or not they will develop cancer, and get a pretty accurate output prediction about how likely they are to. In this example, the neural network that was used to predict cancer had an accuracy of 94.2%. This is much higher than what humans could reasonably predict, and other studies and neural networks have had similar accuracy rates in predicting cancers. The researchers were then able to go on to create further models to find the factors which seemed to lead to higher rates of cancer occurrence, which they found to be related to folate deficiency and estrogen exposure. And with this prediction, healthcare providers can then focus on an ideal course of treatment and address any nutrient or hormone deficiencies or excesses as needed in order to help prevent cancer before it even happens. These are the very basics of machine learning using neural networks, and you can see how it would be a very powerful tool. Many researchers are using similar tools to try to combat cancer in many different ways. Microsoft, for example, is pouring tons of research into research groups who are using artificial intelligence and machine learning to fight cancer. One team of Microsoft researchers are using machine learning to help oncologists figure out the most effective, individualized cancer treatment for their patients by providing an intuitive way to sort through all the research data available. In recent years, the amount of data being gathered is astounding, including patients' entire genomes. Oncologists say they are drowning in information. Researchers are trying to use machine learning to help make sense of all that data. Other research groups are pairing machine learning with computer vision to give radiologists a better understanding of how their patients' tumors are progressing. And yet another team is working on efforts that could one day allow scientists to program cells to fight cancer, which sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. All sorts of industries are now adopting this technology, and we'll only see more of it as time goes on. From helping with cancer diagnosis, to recommending products on Amazon, to driving our cars, machine learning is an elegant, powerful tool that we can use to understand our world and can impact our society in some very significant ways. We are just scratching the surface of all the ways that it can be used, and researchers are coming up with new applications for it all the time. It's a complicated subject, but its power as a tool can't be understated. This video just begins to scratch the surface of machine learning and touches on just one of many treads in the field. If you've been inspired to learn more, or perhaps have your own ideas on how to implement this amazing technology, a great place to start learning more is Brilliant. They have several courses related to this topic, including this one dedicated to artificial neural networks. In this course, you will dive into the fundamentals of artificial neural networks. As you progress through each section, your learning is tested and reinforced by answering fun questions. If you answer something incorrectly, it does not impede your progress. Instead, Brilliant allows you to check the solution and explanation so you can correct your misconceptions and carry on learning. These courses are curated brilliantly to bring you from a basic understanding of science and maths to having a deep understanding. If you find this section too difficult, you can always refresh your fundamental math skills before returning to it. Or if you are already familiar with neural networks, you can take the follow-up course in machine learning. Feeling inspired? Then go to brilliant.org forward slash real engineering and sign up for free. And the first 73 people to go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, subreddit and Discord server are below.